if you succeed, you have material success, you have happiness, you gain a kingdom, you want to do it for your people on the one hand for your people because you love them, but on the other hand, because your people give you the biggest ego boost you can imagine. But then the challenges we go through in our life are also huge to us while we're in it. There's two sides. You don't know what to do. Should I do this? Should I do that? And we play all the games that Arjun is playing to trick ourselves. But which direction does that take us? Towards the Drashtra or the Lord? Satyam Param Dilahi 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 <clears throat> We're at chapter one, verse 21. Actually, we did 21 last time, but we'll begin there. So, Mala, let's start with that verse in Sanskrit and then English. Arjuna <laughs> Ubacha. Sena your ruba your madhi Ratham stapa yame chuta. Now, O Lord of the earth, seeing your sons arrayed against him, and when missiles were ready to be hurled, Arjuna, who had the figure of Hanuman on the flag of his chariot, took up his bow and then addressed the following words to Sri Krishna Krishna, place my chariot between the two armies. Yava detani rekshayam yo dukamana vasthitan kairmaya saka yo dhavyam asmindrana samudhyami and keep it there till I have carefully observed these warriors drawn up for battle and have seen with whom I have to engage in this fight. Okay. So remember what we talked about last time? Do you? What on earth makes someone say, okay, take my chariot. You're at war. Conch shells have blown. It is imminent. It's about to begin. And suddenly Arjun says, oh, take me to the middle of on both sides, middle of the battlefield. I think that is prerna. I don't think that that's something Arjun is doing or his small mind is already underneath starting to get a little nervous. He's finally starting to get conscious about what he's agreed to or what he's decided to do. Yes? Continue. Yotsya manana vekshayam yayete prasamagataha dharta rashtrasya durbuddhehe priyachikesha yudhe priyachikeshavaha. I shall scan the well wishers of evil minded Duryodhana. In this war, whoever have assembled on his side and are ready for the fight. Sanjaya Uvacha Eva Mukto Rishi Kesho Guda Keshina Bharata Sena Yor Rupa Yor Madhye Stapa Yitwara Totamam 
भीष्म द्रोण प्रम प्रमुख उवाच पार्थ पश्यूनी संजय सेज ओ किंग तस् एड्रेस्ड बाय अर्जुना श्री कृष्णा प्लेस द मैग्निफिसेंट चैरियट बिटवीन द टू आर्मीज इन फ्रंट ऑफ भीष्मा द्रोना एंड ऑल द किंग्स एंड सेज Arjuna behold these kauravas assembled here I think we could stop here a second There's a whole army in front of them of the kauravas and where does the lord takes the chariot in front of who The two favorite people that Arjuna is most connected with Dronacharya and Bhishma. He could have put the chariot in front of Duryodhan. Would we have this conversation now? Yes or no? No. He has no problems with Duryodhan. He has no love loss with Duryodhan. He's not sitting there what he's about to start to feel with Dronacharya and Bhishma Pita. But the Lord takes the chariot, puts it directly in front of two of his favorite people. The people he loves the most. Dronacharya and Bhishma. I mean, think about it, Dronacharya. This is a guru who took someone's thumb and to make him the greatest warrior, right? He took Eklavya's thumb to show Arjun how much he loves him, how much his promise means to him. For those of you who don't know, some of you are new to this. So Dronacharya is Arjun's guru. The Pandavas, the five bros that we've been talking about on Arjuna's side, and the Kauravas, the cousins on the other side, were educated and trained in archery by their guru, Dronacharya. And Arjun is a great warrior, archer. And his guru, Dronacharya, had promised him that he would be known as the world's greatest archer. And it just so happens that this young hunter boy happens to live in the woods where they're getting trained and he watches or observes Dronacharya teaching the noble prince, Arjuna, his brothers and the Kauravas. So he goes to Dronacharya and says, I want to become your student. Please guide me, please teach me. And Dronacharya, there were rules at the time, he could not teach anyone but the royal prince. That was his commitment. That was the rule. So he says no to the hunter boy and says, I'm so sorry, I cannot teach you. So he says, no problem. He, the hunter boy, Eklavya, he says, no problem. He hides behind the tree, observes Dronacharya teaching the Pandavas for a few sessions. And then he goes back to his cave, makes a murti of the guru, a statue of the guru, Dronacharya. And he learns to bow and arrow, archery. And one fine day, it turns out there's a wolf running or a, or a dog, you know, wolf or a dog running across the woods. And Arjun, being the great archer, he's shooting arrows. However, Eklavya, his, art, his arrows are going to the eye directly right? He is actually the better hunter. So they want to find out who is this guy. And Dronacharya goes to Eklavya and asks him, well, who taught you? Who's your guru? And he takes them to the cave and points to the statue. And it turns out to be the statue of Dronacharya. I mean, of, uh, of the guru, Dronacharya. And he says, this is my guru. So in those times, as is now, when someone gives you something, wisdom, knowledge, then there is something called dakshina, skillful giving. You offer something energetic exchange for what you have received. And so Dronacharya says, you have to give me dakshina, something that has been promised. Now listen, Dronacharya has made a promise to Arjun. You will be the greatest archer ever known. Are you with me? He doesn't want to fall back on his words. Remember what we've been talking about the last two sessions. Everybody's at war because of their own internal, personal, me and mine going on. 
Are we clear and remember that, right? If we don't put ourselves in the place of Arjun, if we don't realize that the battlefield is going on right now in our own system, guess what happens? We start to see the knowledge as something esoteric, something out there to get enlightened about. And that is not the Bhagavad Gita. This is not the Upanishad. We are not talking about Brahma Gyan by a student who's asking for Brahma Gyan. We're talking about a student like me, like you, a more extreme, very extreme situation who's got to navigate his mind and his responsibilities of life. Is this clear? Are we clear about this? Yeah. So... Dronacharya is on the other side of Arjuna. He had promised Arjun, you would be the greatest warrior. And now here it is, this hunter boy is clearly a better hunter than Arjuna. So in exchange for his skills and wisdom provided, Dronacharya asks Eklavya to give his right thumb. To me, it seems really cruel. Does that seem like that to you? Yes. yes. Like, seriously? What kind of guru is that? But he did it to maintain his promise, which is what? Which is what? Yeah. But that's that's a sign of ego to me. I need to uphold the promise that I gave to one of my students. Otherwise, I will be known as one who didn't keep his promise. Don't romanticize. Again, I'm saying to you, don't romanticize the characters as much as you can put yourself in that position. We're not judging anybody. We're just looking at the situation from the perspective that takes us further onto the next step in our own navigation, in our own mind. And so he takes the right thumb of Eklavya in exchange for his wisdom. That is the Dakshina. In fact, <laughs> Eklavya learns to then shoot an arrow equally well. He does it with his toe. You know, he, he's so good. He does it with his toe. But now Eklavya is not known as the greatest archer, better than Arjun. He's known as the greatest devotee. No? He, and so Arjun still remains the greatest archer, but that's debatable. But I just want you to notice here, his guru who did this much for him is right in front of him. And then Bhishma Pita is more than a grandfather and more than a father to him. This is in his lap who Arjun has grown up. And those are the two people directly in front of him. That's where Krishna Bhagwan puts the chariot and says, behold, the army of the Kauravas. Dronacharya is not a Kaurava. Neither is Bhishma, but this is what we're looking at. This is where you could say God's hand is at play. This is where, with or without Arjun's asking, already the divine power is taking Arjun, like us, to our next higher, greater good. Are we clear? Okay, continue. Tatra now, Arjuna saw stationed here, there, in both the armies as uncles, grand uncles, and teachers. Even great grand uncles, maternal uncles, brothers and cousins, sons and nephews, and grand nephews, even so friends, fathers in law, and well wishers as well. Seeing all the relations present there, Arjuna was overcome with deep compassion and spoke thus in sorrow. <laughs> How does he get overcome with compassion and then speaks in sorrow? They're kind of contrary emotions at some level, 
to, you understand what what is being said. So let's let's first get very very clear. If this war was full, Arjun is fighting an enemy, it would not be a problem. What has happened is there's a divide in one family. Some are closer as friends and family, and some are a little further away, and that's the opposite side. Do you understand? We love the world in black and white. That's how we operate. But the world is where? Gray. It's very gray. I know that my biggest lesson for me, my dad used to say when I was young, he would kind of bring my mother into the picture and he would say, Madhu, you better teach her something. She sees everything in black and white and the world is gray and it's going to eat her up. This is how he would speak. When we make decisions, stay alert, okay? Don't. <laughs> when we have to choose, when something happens in our life, we like to divide it in right and wrong. Yes? We like to break it up into two pieces, but decisions are never really that clear, are they? No, they're very gray, and that's exactly what is happening on the battlefield. It's not black and white. He's not, Arjun is not clear, those are my enemies, those are friends, family. Just so happens that some are closer to him and some are a little further away. This is the gray area. And this is the critical issue in the Bhagavad Gita. You have to remember again, Arjun is not asking for Brahmagyan. He doesn't want to get enlightened. Is he asking for that? No. It's a question in the question basket, like what we do with Gurudev. He has to navigate his mind. So right now, Lord Krishna, you can kind of see him as the first greatest psycho you know, Manovignan expert ever. He has to navigate Arjun and the mind where Arjun is stuck. Are we clear? This is very, very, very important. Do not get confused into thinking. Arjun is now asking for Brahmagyan and Krishna is giving him the highest of knowledge because if that were the case, there's no communication between the guru and the student, between Lord Krishna and Arjuna. That is not the case. When Arjun goes up, Lord Krishna rises to that place. When Arjun drags himself down, the mind goes down. Then Lord Krishna comes there and picks him up and moves him forward. It's a continuous conversation of Arjun navigating through this dilemma of what do I do in this moment? I have to fight and I'm facing people that I love, that are my friends, that are my family. And I don't want to do it. And he doesn't come right out and say it. He just says, oh my God, I'm going to have to fight all my friends and keen. And this is not what I want to do. Continue. Remember this, okay? This, you have to go back to again and again and again. Otherwise, you're going to get lost in, oh, he's giving Brahmagyan. So how do I live that? No, no. It's how do you navigate your life and the conflicts that we have going on in our mind? That's where we're headed. Arjuna Uvacha Drishtve Mam Swajanam Krishna Juyutsum Samupastitam Sidanti Mama Gatrani Mukham Saparishushyati Vepatushchasa Vepatushchasa Di Reme Roma Harshascha Jayate Arjuna said, Krishna, as I see the skinsmen arrayed for battle, my limbs give way and my mouth is getting parched. Nay, a shiver runs through my body and hair stands on end. Gandhi vamsram sati hastat tvakshaiva pariduhkyate nacha shaknumya vasthatum the bow Gandiva slips from my hand and my skin too burns all over. My mind is whirling as it were and I can no longer hold myself steady. Vimitani cha pashyami viparitani keshava nacha shreyuno pashyami 
and Keshava, I see such omens of evil, nor do I see any good in killing my kinsmen in battle. Okay, so every sensation in his body is saying he's not ready, he's not prepared to fight, correct? Mm -hmm. The bow is slipping out of his hand, he's shivering, the hands are shaking. The body is already giving all the signals that Arjun is, is not ready, not prepared for battle. He has seen his uncle, his teacher, his friends, so on and so forth, right in front of him, and it slips away. But then he doesn't say, I'm scared. I want to run away. What does he do? Read that last sentence. What does he do? I, I can no longer hold myself steady. Mm -hmm. And Keshava, I see such omens of evil. Omen of evil. He now suddenly starts to get righteous. How many times do we do that in our life? When we don't want to do something, what do we do? We justify. We start coming up with reasons why we should or should not do something. Correct? So he's already starting to go down that very wise. I see omen. This is not going to be a good thing. I don't. It's not I don't want to do this. It's not I'm scared. It's not I'm done. I don't want it's, this is going to be bad news. It's omen. It's a sign of something terrible. We romanticize, we justify, we give excuses, we give reasons so that we don't have to do what we don't want to do. That's the road he's going down. Continue. Krishna <laughs> Kim Krishna, I do not covet victory, nor kingdom, nor pleasures. Govinda, of what use will kingdom or luxuries or even life be to us? So he sounds like he's, you know, dispassionate, right? Renouncing. Tyagi, like he's renouncing everything. What good is any of this? Is that what he's saying? Is he saying, what good is the kingdom? What good is, you know, winning the throne? There's no point. Is he saying that? What is he really saying? No, he's saying all of that stuff is good as long as I don't have to kill my own people. You see, he sounds like he's over wanting material happiness or kingdom or progress for his kingdom, or expanding his kingdom, like a great Tyagi. Like he's gotten over all of those things. Doesn't that, isn't that what it sounds like? Mm -hmm. But that's not it. It's not that he doesn't want happiness. It's not that he doesn't want the kingdom to grow. It is not that he doesn't want victory. It is not that he doesn't want war. It is not even that he's against war. It is that he wants it all if he doesn't have to kill his own people. It's conditional state of wanting what he wants, but this is now a beginning of something. He has been trained his whole life, just like Duryodhan across from him. The only thing he has been trained for is to go to war, to win, to fight. And suddenly, what suddenly he is against war and fighting and against expanding his kingdom. That's not the case. That's what he's been trained for. It's if then, this is the scenario he's in. If I have this and this and this, then I want all of it. But if I don't have, then I don't want. It's a sign of conditional happiness. Is this not how we operate in life? Mm -hmm. Everything is based on, if I have this, it would be great. If not, I don't want it. He doesn't want to fulfill the condition. He doesn't want to kill people in order to gain all those things. He wants to run. He wants to avoid. And instead of owning that, he's justifying. He's becoming an honorary, you know, dharmic person. Is Arjun dharmic person in this moment? Mm -hmm. Not really. He's headed that way. Look, he's very sincere. You have to understand. Gurudev called him a seeker of knowledge. Remember the first video? 
Gurudev said, Arjuna is a seeker of knowledge. In this case, he's seeking to know what is the correct thing to do? What do I do? I'm in this dilemma. What is the best thing for me to do? How do I proceed forward? So he's very sincere in asking his questions. There, there is processing going on. Unlike Duryodhan or maybe even Bhim. They're just, let's go fight for it. There's no consciousness there about it. There's like, these people I want to kill and I'm going to kill them and I have revenge and I've got my reasons and I'm going for it. But Arjun is more sincere. He's more conscious. He's more alert. He's more awake. He's now saying something's off here. What do I do? Are you with me? And don't forget, it's conditional. He wants it all. He's not yet done. See, there's two roads. Remember the first conversation? Dudrashta, the darkness, unconscious, conditioned behavior. And then there is the Lord, a wakefulness, conscious act of living. Are we clear? Moving towards the divine. And in between is Arjun. And we've, of course, talked about Sanjaya. Are you, are you all with me? So don't, do not, there's no reason to start thinking that this now is Brahmagyan. It is not yet there. All we're doing is learning how to navigate the mind. It's Manovignan. Leading us to Dharma. You know, something that's always occurred to me, and I remember once saying to Guruji, Gurudev, all this knowledge, like Upanishad, Ashtavakra Gita also, they're not really, these are people who experienced it and who articulate the highest Brahmagnan. It's kind of like proof. If you have a glimpse of this wisdom and you read Upanishad, you get proof that you are in that state. But if you have a glimpse of it, you don't need proof. Upanishad, Brahmagnan, these kind of knowledge like Ashtavakra, they're not, they're descriptive. They actually are gurus talking to other gurus, enlightened beings talking to other enlightened beings. Do you understand what I'm saying? And Gurudev said, yes, and we don't need the knowledge. <laughs> it's understand something. Upanishad are proof of something. Whereas this, at least at this stage, is Manovignan, managing, navigating the mind, which will lead us to the doorstep of Brahmagnan. What happens at the end of the Bhagavad Gita? Arjun surrenders the mind, his own small mind. I like it. I don't like it. This should be, this should not be. But why? But why? But why? You know, you have a four-year-old who asks why for everything. He finally surrenders. When you surrender, when the mind dissolves itself, now the doorway to Brahmagnan opens. And that's where Bhagavad Gita ends. So this is another very important piece. I don't know about you, but for the longest time, I sort of would view Brahma, uh, Bhagavad Gita more like reaching the ultimate goal versus navigating my life to get to that very sincere state of saying, okay, there's more to life than this. And Arjuna is starting to talk about it. There's more to wealth, happiness, kingdom. There's more to this than what I've been thinking about all this time. That's the beginning of the question here. Are we clear? Do you guys follow what I'm saying? This is an important piece. Yeah, continue. no. <laughs> Rajyam bhoga sukhani cha tayi me vasita yudhe pranam syaktva dhanani cha acharya pitara putraha tathaiva cha pitamaha matula shvashura pautraha shala sambandhi nastata those very persons for whose sake we covet the kingdom, luxuries and pleasures, teachers, uncles, sons and nephews, and even so grand uncles and great grand uncles, maternal uncles, fathers-in-law, grand nephews, brothers-in-law and other relations 
are here arrayed on the battlefield, staking their lives and wealth. <clears throat> Another grandiose statement, no? I'm here to fight for the kingdom for the uncles and the grand uncles and the nephews and all of them. And they're here staking their life for me. Are they? They're not. Everybody's there for their own reasons. The entire war is full of characters and heroes and warriors who each have a purpose to fight against somebody on the other side. Everybody's caught in me and mine. And is Arjun really at battle fighting for the kingdom for all those people or for himself? Yeah, clearly. Kings don't go fighting just for the uncles and the great grand uncles and so on and so forth. It's for themselves. He's at war. He's been trained to expand his kingdom for himself. And there's nobody in front of him who's taking their life for him. This is all just reasons and excuses not to deal with the thing that's in front of him. How often do we navigate our life like this? Where we're not transparent, we're not clear, we're not really looking at the situation for what it is. We skirt the issue. We keep coming around it so that we don't have to deal with what's in front of us. Yes? This is really how the human nature is. This is how we deal with things. And that's exactly what Arjun is doing. Now, remember, you have to really understand his position. I mean, this is not, you know, some small little thing. Should I go to my uncle's wedding who I don't like very much because he insulted my mother? That's not what this is. This is war. He is sitting, standing in front of everybody that he has known his whole life. And directly in front of him are two of the most important figures of his life. So you have to see the extreme situation he's in. However, whatever situation we are battling inside of ourselves is no less of a war than where Arjun is. Are we clear? We do exactly the same thing. In order to avoid, in order to support what our small mind wants to do, the egoic direction of where we think we should go, what do we do? We justify, we sound righteous, we come up with lofty reasons, we romanticize our reasons. That's what's happening. And let's also look, who is talking? Is Arjun the warrior saying all this or someone else? Who is talking? What role is Arjun talking? He's talking as a nephew. He's talking as a student. He's not talking as a warrior. Do you remember we spoke about this on the second session towards the end? That Q&A is very important to go back and listen to that last question of the second session. See, to be 100%, to make life as simple as it can be, what we need to do is who we are, where we are, when we are needs to be 100%. So right now, Arjun is in the battlefield. Who needs to show up? The warrior. Instead, who has shown up? The nephew and the student and the uncle and the whatever. All other relations have shown up in Arjun, but not the warrior. And this is where the chaos stops. We do the same exact thing in life. You have to make a decision as a father, you start thinking as a son. You have to make a decision as a son, you start thinking as an expert in something. Are we clear? Continue. Eta nahantu michami, gnatopi madhu sudana, api trailo kya rajasya, eto kim no mahi krete. O slayer of madhu, I do not want to kill them. Even though they slay me, even for the sovereignty over the three worlds, how much the less for king, the kingdom here on earth? <laughs> Who offered him the three kingdoms or the heaven, kingdom of heaven? Did anybody offer him that? Yes or no? No. no. But he's saying, 
I wouldn't want to kill them, not even for the kingdoms in heaven, not for all the three lokas. I do not want to kill them. I wouldn't kill. Let somebody else do that. Would I do such a thing like that? First of all, nobody offered him any kingdom. That to the heaven, kingdom of heaven. But Luke, he's so righteous and so, you know, grandiose about it. Would I? I would never kill anybody, not even for the kingdom of heaven, let alone this pathetic kingdom on this earth. Why would I do such a thing? Do you see where he's headed? Yes? How often does this show up in our life where we get like that? You know, that's not my cup of tea. I wouldn't do that. I say that a hundred times and I catch myself saying, oh, what, what, who, who, who made you like, who died and made you king or queen? Do you understand? This is something we do to justify what we want. He wants something. He doesn't want to fight. He wants to run and he wants permission to run from Krishna. He needs validation. Do we do that? How often do we go to ask question to Gurudev for which we have an answer, but we don't want to, the responsibility for it. We don't want to own it. So we want to go and ask Guruji. And if he gives an answer that's in that direction, then very loudly, Guruji said. <laughs> yes, that's exactly where he's at. He's not any different. We're not any different. Guruji said. And if Guruji gives an answer that you didn't want, then you say, I'm not sure if Guruji heard me. <laughs> yes or no, we do do this. Or we say, you know, I didn't get to tell him the whole story. I need to tell him all the facts because he told me this before I finished. <laughs> Lord Krishna doesn't need to know where Arjun's going by Arjun's mouth. He knows. He knows exactly where Arjun is headed. He knew where Arjun was going. That's why he put the chariot directly in front of the two people. The fact that he asked the Lord, to, oh, to, so that I can see who I'm fighting. On one level, that's a good thing. When we have to make decisions in the gray shade, it's good to know on both sides exactly what is going on. Correct? So in some sense, that's also what's being described here. He wants to see before he chooses what exactly is going on. But the thing is, the decision is already made. Now he's justifying. In his mind, he's already, the body is giving all the experiences and the sensations that he's already decided. He's not thinking, he's not questioning, he's not articulating. Look at the sensations, what his body is going through. He's made the decision. He just now needs somebody to put a validation stamp on it. Yes? And Lord Krishna is not, you know, he's like the guru. He's the guru. He's not going to buy into it. We start, oh, yeah, I understand. You may not want to do that. But that's not where this is going. No? Continue. Nihatya dharta rashtranaka kapriti Krishna, how can we hope to be happy slaying the sons of Dhritarashtra? By killing even those desperados, sin will surely accrue to us. <laughs> Listen, look how he's stacking his argument. How can we be happy? Is he someone who's saying... There is no happiness to be gained in the world. Is Arjun one of those people right now? Mm -hmm. No, clearly not. Actually, he does see that there's happiness to be gained, but just not by slaying. Mm -hmm. He wants happiness. He sees there's happiness in the world. There is kingdom to be you know, claimed and evolved and grow and all those things. He's just saying not by slaying my own people. He's not over the illusion of happiness. He's still pursuing it. He still wants it. He still has that Brahma, that delusion that I will find happiness by doing this, this, and this. He just doesn't want to kill his own people. Now, the, remember the conversation about me? What's mine is me and what's me is mine. Remember that? If I kill what's mine, my people, who else am I killing? 
You have to think about this. It's really what is me is mine. And what is mine is me. So if something happens to what is mine, what also happens to me? This he hasn't brought up at all. But underneath it is that. Underneath the whole thing is a certain degree of, look, it's true that we want accolades from other people, but strangers don't give us as much of an ego boost as the people we know. Are you all with me? If I do something great, those who know me and say, wow, Didi, that was amazing. You did that, that's great. Oh, wow, you have a big mansion. Showing off the big mansion to those that are ours, we get a boost of our ego. Mm -hmm. It's not strangers so much. Strangers will walk by and they'll say something, whatever it is. But if you succeed, you have material success, you have happiness, you gain a kingdom, you want to do it for your people on the one hand for your people because you love them, but on the other hand, because your people give you the biggest ego boost you can imagine. You, you look a little like, what? Are you all with me? Yes. Just think about this. What would be the value of killing our own people? It's not because he's so compassionate. What is the value of killing our own people? He is. He loves those people. But there's another layer. It's hidden. It's subtle. That's what actually happens in life. He will win the kingdom. And if all those people who would say, bravo, Arjun, are not around to do that, you don't get the same satisfaction juice out of having succeeded you don't get to blow your chest up four centimeters maybe just two mm -hmm. are you with me this is very tricky this is how our mind functions it finds subtle ways through me and mine to strengthen the small eye that's what's going on what's mine is me mm -hmm. and what's me is mine, mine. Tasman Narha Vayam Hantum Dhartha Rashtran Swabandhavan Swajanam Hikatham Hatwa Sukina Syama Madhava. Therefore, Krishna, it does not behove us to kill our relations, the sons of Dhritarashtra. For how can we be happy after killing our own kinsmen? Suddenly, suddenly he's like, it's, they've been talking about this for months. It's not something that was decided last night. Now suddenly it's, oh, it's not good for us to kill our own people. Krishna is not taking up any weapons. We do this. We want to do something. We need an alliance. We seek out us. Do we not do that? We don't just stand up for what we want. You know, have you noticed Ratri Didi with this thing? Yeah, yeah, I've noticed that too. You get a little stronger because you yourself within yourself are not clear, not strong and are not willing to take the responsibility. So we seek out alliance. And that's exactly what Arjun's doing. But he's asking the Lord to line up with him, with all his nonsense, all his stories, all his righteousness, all his need to feed himself. Yes? Again, it's, you know, it's not trite, the position he's in, but then the challenges we go through in our life are also huge to us while we're in it. There's two sides. You don't know what to do. Should I do this? Should I do that? And we play all the games that Arjun is playing to trick ourselves. But which direction does that take us towards the Drashtra or the Lord? The Drashtra, right? We remain in our conditioned response. And life, whether we like it or not, is pushing us to evolve. It's pushing us to evolve. I mean, us as in particularly if you're here, if you're listening to this, you're on the path, if you have a guru, you're doing some practices and you're looking inward, clearly you're on a journey towards the other side of the equation. But we have to become conscious. The only way out is through that means we have to start to become conscious of how we behave in our day-to-day -day life, how we maneuver and manipulate ourselves and try to do the same with those who are around us. Are we clear? Continue. 
यद्यपि न पश्यन्ति लोपोपगत चेतस कुलक्षयृत दोषम मित्रद्रोहे च पातक कथम नस्मास्मर्ति कुलक्षयृत दोषम प्रपश्यदर्जनादन even though these people with their minds blinded by greed perceive no evil in destroying their own race and no sin in treason to friends why should we not o krishna who see clearly the sin accruing from the destruction of one's family think of desisting from committing this foul deed he just keeps building now he is worried that the dharma will be destroyed is not just enough you know it's like if we kill them we'll wipe out dharma that's basically what he's saying he's really building finding a way to see if krishna would support him he needs that haven't you noticed when you don't want to do something and you know you're chickening out you're afraid you're sliding away from what you know is the correct thing to do you somehow need someone to validate it true mm-hmm. you give yourself lots of reasons we all do that lots of logical reasons lots of lofty reasons lots of what appear to be altruistic reasons like he's doing it's like he suddenly cares for dharma the whole of kit and caboodle oh wow we can't possibly do that these are signs that somewhere we know we're not headed towards the lord we're headed towards the drashtra but this is how the mind works again and again and again it maneuvers itself into strengthening the small eye the small mind yeah continue kulakshaye pranashyanti kula dharma sanatana dharme nashte kulam krishnam adharmo bhivavatyuta age long family traditions disappear with the destruction of a family and virtue having been lost vice takes hold of the entire race look more right i just said he's heading towards building dharma that will be destroyed the whole families will be destroyed everything will be gone i mean he didn't ever have a problem going to war before it's just now remember he was 86 years old during this war Lord Krishna was 89 years old. So these are seasoned warriors. Right? It's not like he's never gone to battle before, he never worried about it before, but now he's worried about all these things and just lining up one more argument after another to convince Lord Krishna at the end to say, "Oh my god, Arjun, yes, yes, you're very right, don't do it." If Arjun would have said, if he would have said, "There's no point in having a kingdom." there is no happiness to be found in the material world i seek no pleasure in the world i just wish to be within me i see no point in violence is not speaking ahimsa had he spoken any of these things guess what there would be no bhagavad gita it would have ended correct but that is not what he's saying again i'm reminding you he's saying i want all those things it's just conditional Yes. Go. Adharma bhibhavat Krishna pradushyanti kulastriya ka strishu dushta suvarshneya jayate varna sankara ka with the preponderance of vice Krishna the women of the family become corrupt and with the corruption of women O descendant of Vrishni, there ensues an intermixture of caste. You're you're starting to see Arjun in another light now, right? More closer to ourselves, yes. His situation is extreme, but the mind is exactly the same. It's a divided mind. That's the other thing. It, he's not clear. I will not fight. If he were, it would also end. he's a divided mind he wants it but he wants it if 
there's conditions. If you would just say, I will not fight, there would be no discussion. He would just say, Lord Krishna, take the chariot out. I want to go home. I'm not going to fight. But that's not what's happening. He wants and doesn't want. This is the struggle. This is the extreme struggle in the mind. It's divided. Is Duryodhan's mind divided? No. He was a little rattled. Remember in the beginning, we talked about that. But is he divided? He is not. Is Bhima's mind divided? No, oh, they're just standing back there thinking, what is he doing now? Where is he going? They're just ready. They're going to go for it. That's it. He's divided. How often are we divided and how do we circumvent? We keep going around and around with our stories and don't ever own up to it. Yeah. Continue. Sankaro naraka yeva kula gnanam kula syacha patanti pitaro he sham lukta pindo the kakriyaha progeny due to the promiscuity damns the destroyers of the race as well as the race itself. Deprived of the offerings of rice and water, shraddha, tarpana, etc., the mainness of their race also fall. All the men will die in war and the women will be left alone and then the women will have all these kind of crazy ideas and our progeny will not be as brave and as strong and as virtuous as it could be if all of us men were around to help the women out. <laughs> he's, he's laying it on thick, you know. Can you imagine if we could see Lord Krishna now? He would have a smirk, like how Gurudev has a smirk on his face when some of us are sitting. But Guruji, if we do that, and then he pulls back, you know. Continue. Doshai retai kula gnanam varna sankara karakai hi utsadhyante jati dharmaha kula dharmascha shashvataha through these evils, bringing about an intermixture of caste, the age-long caste traditions and family customs of the killers of kinsmen get extinct. Oh my God. Look, you, just, you have to understand, look at the arguments. It's like, now we're going to destroy the progeny and everything. Well, he's talking doomsday. Mm -hmm. To that degree, he's giving justification for let me run. Is he unique? Yes or no? He is not. We do the same thing. But if I do this, then oh my God, and then that'll happen. And I'm not sure if that's the best thing to do. What do I do? Correct? We do the same exact thing. It just sounds extreme here, but it is not. His situation is, is dire in that sense. But this is just how we do it, how we handle life. We have to navigate the mind. Again, I'm telling you, listen to what's happening from the perspective of how this happens in our own life, in our own challenges, as we navigate the gray in the world. But when it comes to trying to make the decisions, if you look at his arguments, he's locked it into black and white. Again, it's a very, really, very, very important point to understand. When we get into crisis, what do we do? We look to solve it by making it extreme. It gives us no room to make mistakes. It increases fear. Are you understanding what I'm saying? That's how you invite bigger challenges into your mind. But the situation is great. It's not so black and white. And it would be black and white if he stood there as a warrior this is the situation. This is how it is. I've gone through everything I had to. It didn't work. So now let's go. Let's finish it off. Then it would be Dharma Chitra. Right? Continue. Utsanna Kula Dharmanam Manushyanam Janardana Narake Niyatam Vaso Bhavati Tyanushushruma Krishna, we hear that men who have lost their family 
traditions dwell in hell for an indefinite period of time. <laughs> Keep going. We hear this is the case. Okay. Thank you for sharing, Arjun. Aho batamakat papam kartum vyavasita vayam yedra jasukhalo bhina hantum swajana mudyataha. Oh, what a pity. Though possessed of intelligence, we have set our mind on the commission of a great sin that due to lust for throne and enjoyments, we are intent on killing our own kinsmen. Yeah, you see, again, he has no problem killing. He has no problem for the lust and the greed for the throne. He just has a problem killing his own people. And again, it's a very subtle way where his ego is at stake. It's not just love and light for kinsmen. He's in some unconscious way. It's during crisis that we actually get to see who we are. Has that not been the case? When situations like this arise, that's when we discover where we stand. And what's happening is, yes, he cares for his teacher and so on and so forth, but also he's seeing his own demise of his own greatness. That is really also at stake here. We do things for our family, but I'm telling you, at some level or another, what we do for our family is what we're doing for ourselves. Yadi mama prati karam ashastram shastra parnayaka dharta rashtra rane ghanyahu tan mekshemataram bhavet. It would be better for me if the sons of Dhritarashtra, armed with weapons, kill me in battle while I am unarmed and unresisting. <laughs> Such a sense of sacrifice. I'd rather die than to do this. Look how much I, ego, is in all the statements that are starting to show up. It appears like he's being altruistic and caring and compassionate for the other, but I'd rather die better they kill me than I kill them. How could I do such a deed? How could I destroy progeny and dharma and so on and so forth? Let them do it. These are all stories so that he doesn't have to choose. And maybe he can convince the Lord to align with him and say, you're right. Go home. Yes? Go. Sanjaya uvacha eva muktva arjuna sanke rathopasta upavishat visrijya shasharam chapam shoka samvigna manasaka. Sanjaya said, Arjuna, whose mind was agitated by grief on the battlefield, Having spoken thus, and having cast aside his bow and arrows, sank into the hinder part of his chariot. That's the end of the chapter one, Didi. Okay, great. Let's just close our eyes, chant the closing mantra, and if you need to go, you can drop. <clears throat> eyes closed. Chant with me. Satyam param dimahi 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 Thank you.